It's just an honor and a pleasure to be here. And I won't prolong the time, uh, like Pastor Dutch said. Uh, today we will be starting a new series called Maturing in Faith. Um, and we will be coming from the book of James. Uh, James, if you have any good electronic device or a Bible or anything you would like to follow along, uh, please turn with me to the book of James, the first chapter. Uh, we will read verses 1 through 4. James, the first chapter. Verses 1 through 4. It reads as follows. Now we read from the New American Standard Bible. It says, James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all good, my brothers and sisters. When you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Amen. Amen. If I may borrow your hearts and ears for just a moment, I'd like to use for a subject on today and tell someone that God still cares for you. God still cares for you. Amen. Before we get started, let us go to the throne of grace for a word of prayer. To the Alpha and the Omega, to the beginning and the end, to the creator of heaven and earth, to the sovereign one, to the one who sits high and looks low. Gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you today, Lord, just for giving us this opportunity, Lord, to come together, Lord, as your people, Lord, to just lift up your name, Lord. Father, we just thank you for preserving us throughout the week, Lord. Thank you for giving us uh, your same grace, Father God, your new mercy that you give us every day, Lord. Thank you for a sound mind, Lord. Thank you for giving us the strength and the courage, Lord, to just be able to do the things you call us to do, Lord. Right now, Lord, we just come asking, Lord, that you just continue to saturate this place with your Holy Spirit, Lord, as the bread of life comes forth, Lord. As your bread comes forth, Lord, yes, that your bread, the bread and the word, Lord, just penetrate and pierce the hearts of your people on today, Lord. Because we know that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that receives out of the mouth of God, Lord. So we definitely know how essential your word is on today, Lord. And as I get ready to glorify you, Lord, I just pray that, Lord, that I decrease, Father God, and that you increase, Lord, as your son done the Baptist here. And I pray these things in your son Jesus' name, that every car and truck come to the Amen. So I, I came up with the subject, and I kind of wanted to raise a question because, you know, in the time of going through things, you know, a lot of times we like to question God, you know, and we feel like something's not right, you know. Um, I like to think about, you know, in football, you know, the head coach have a red flag in his back pocket. That red flag is called a challenge flag. It's a flag that he uses when he feels like the official or referee has made a misstep on a certain particular play. Maybe he's challenging the play because there may have been a turnover that was called that wasn't necessarily a turnover or something happened on that particular play that the head coach disagreed with. So we as Christians, also have or utilize or try to utilize a red flag when we're going through certain things in our life and we throw our red flag out on God and say, God, something's not right. This can't be life. This can't be what's supposed to be happening. So today, I just want us to see what James tells his fellow Christians who are dispersed out of that foreign land. The first thing I want us to see is that there is no escaping a trial. All of us have to go through something. All, everybody has to go through a trial. James said, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet. The key at word in there is when. He didn't say if we meet, but when we meet trials of various kinds. So, one of the things I want to highlight today is why do we go through trial? Because we know that we're going to go through a trial. We're going to go through a season or a period in our lives where there are thunderstorms, 
there's snow, there's rain, there's, there's something going on that just doesn't seem right. Sometimes we may think, God, what have I done? Sometimes we may say, God, what have you done? But James wants his Christians, fellow Christians, to know that trials are part of life. It says that trials produce spiritual maturity, and trials are also given to glorify God. Therefore, that is why we must count it all good. <laughs> Therefore, that's why we were counting our joy because God gives us trials for us to see the reason. He gives us trials for spiritual maturity and also, like I said, to glorify God. The Greek word for count means to consider or evaluate. So when we go through these things, we need to evaluate what we're going through and consider them with joy. Because the remedy for a trial or when you're going through a trial is to count in all good. Now one may say, how can I count in good when I'm going through something that doesn't feel right? It doesn't look right? It ain't right. Well, I want to quote something that John McArthur said. Uh, John McArthur, he said, the natural woman was going to hardship and difficulty and rarely rejoices. Therefore, the believer must make a conscious commitment to face trials with joy. So every time we go through a trial, we have to be committed to counting our good. Now don't miss that piece. Because when God goes through a trial, which you have to know how to go through the trial that God may present to you. See, the word trials come from the Greek word that connotes trouble. Now, I like this definition that I find. It says, or something that breaks the pattern of peace, comfort, joy, and happiness in someone's life. So when you go through a trial, everything in your life is being destroyed. Your peace, your happiness, your joy, all of those things are at stand for you. You can't find it. Because you're in this particular place that God has you for spiritual maturity. So when you get to that place, you have to find that joy and persevere through because James said, count what? All joy. Even when you go through various kinds of trials. Because it's not, the thing about it is, it's not one trial, it's not two trials. Trials are something we're going to have to go through as Christians throughout the duration of our life. And once you get out of one trial, you best believe at some point you're going to go through a one. So how do you know who you are or what you have if you can't be tested? How can you evaluate the authenticity of something by trial or testing? See, one of the things God wants to know that what we have is real. So in order for you to know what you have is real, it has to be tested. You have to go through something to know who you are. That's all of us, not some of us. Remember that. All of us, in order for us to know who we are, we have to go through something. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 to 6 that examine yourself, test yourself to see where you stand in the faith. So in order for us to know who we are, we have to also test ourselves along with going through these gutters of trials that God may present our way. James is telling his fellow Christians in us today that as his brother Jesus was tested in the wilderness, so will we. Think about it. We're treating the God. So if God experienced trials, tribulations, who are we to think that we want to experience trials and tribulations? Because we are children of God. So we're going to suffer for righteousness' sake. Because God has imputed his righteousness upon us when he gave his life as a substitutionary atonement on behalf of us. And I want to give up a biblical example of what I'm talking about. Y'all remember the story in John chapter 11, uh, Mary and Martha, 
uh, and that's what Lazarus pretty much. So y'all remember, Mary and Martha, they sent words to Jesus. Jesus was in Jerusalem. He was two miles away from the they were in He told, they told him, they said, Jesus, Lazarus is sick. Lazarus is sick. And you know what Jesus told him? Jesus didn't respond to him. He had a disciple to him. When he told his disciples was, Lazarus' death, Lazarus' sickness does not lead to death. Now, I will specify what he meant by that, but I wanted to see how Mary and Martha responded. I'm going to go back to it. When Jesus arrived uh, two days later, so it says, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus responded to her and said, Your brother will rise again, Martha, said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he not, yet he shall live. So, after he encountered Martha, here come Mary. A few verses later. It says, now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now this is the part they missed. They knew Jesus was the Messiah. They knew Jesus was God incarnate. But you see how their faith is wavering here because Jesus had already knew that was sick. Jesus was two miles away from Lazarus, but he came three, four days later. Yes, sir. And so, watch how, watch how this build up, man. So, I want us to think about it. Martha and Mary took the right approach. You know, in church, we got a we sing a song, Jesus. There's something on the main line. Tell him words. So, Jesus was on the main line for them. Yes, sir. But what they had to realize is that Jesus was doing something greater. He wanted to do something greater. They showed him something greater. That was going to strengthen their faith. So, in verse 38, it says, When Jesus said, He moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a strong man. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Now, watch what Martha was going to do. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by the time they were getting older, for he had been dead for four days, Jesus said to her, Now, wait a minute. He told her to move the stone. She gonna tell Jesus that when Jesus we move the stone, it's it, you know what I'm saying, it's gonna be a little smell and all of it. Jesus didn't ask about this. Sometimes we better do the simple thing that God tells us to do than to get us to where we need to be. So he was telling Martha, all you need to do, move the stone out of the way, and let me take care of everything here. So after he removed the stone, he said to her, Did I not tell you? And if you believe, you will see the glory of God. Now, let me go back to what Jesus first told his disciples when, when the word first came back to him that Lazarus was sick. In the fourth verse of that same chapter, before Jesus even went to see Mary and Martha and Tim to Lazarus, he told his disciples, This sickness will not end in death, but it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified watch you. Through. Catch that, man. He said, so the Son of God may be glorified through. So even though it seemed like Lazarus' death was the end, it wasn't. Because after God raised Lazarus up, everybody who was there, their faith was strengthened. Because they knew then that, oh, wow, this is the true Messiah. God can do any and everything. And that is the type of mindset we have to have as Christians, knowing that when we go through these trials, that God gives us trials to strengthen our faith. Now, my second point is, faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. Faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. How do you know this if something is real and genuine for our test? So I'm asking the question, what is faith? The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11 and 1 that what? Faith is such a thing, hope for and every missing thing I see, right? We should all know that as believers, right? But when we go down four more verses, 
Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6, 5, excuse me, it says what? It is impossible to please God without what? Faith. So watch this. So if in the trials, think about what James said. We go back to what James told us, man. Count it all joy when you meet trials of various kind, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfast. So if you don't have faith in your trial, not only can you not withstand your trial, but you also, uh, it's impossible for you to please God in your trial, or to please God just in will. Because you have to have faith. Faith is the centrality of, of your trial. If there's no faith, there's nothing. There's no, the faith is the foundation. If we don't have faith when we're going through something, you don't have anything. And this is what James is trying to communicate to his fellow Christians. So think about this. Faith produces patience. I want you to take this down. Faith produces patience. Patience produces endurance. Endurance produces maturity. Yes, sir. Let me say that again. Patience produces no, excuse me, faith produces patience. Patience produces endurance, and endurance produces maturity. You see how all this go together? And how it's, it, it's growing. Things are growing, things are evolving. And this is what this is how God has ordained things to move. So as Christians, there's a certain way we have to tackle our trial. And it starts with faith. See, one of the things I want to tell you is faith is not equal to fear. Faith, faith does not equate to fear. Now, one of the things I heard, I want to read this to you. He says, to allow your feeling to guide your faith, it's like a truck being controlled by the cargo in his truck rather than by the wheel that he is steering. It is the wheel that is controlling the cargo and not the cargo that controls the wheel. So, so many times we let our feelings control us and tell us what to do. But James is telling us that no, we need to allow our faith to be our guide for us, be, be the guide for us, and not our feelings. Because our feelings are going to go doing something else the next minute. Our feelings will deceive us, basically, what I'm trying to say. Feelings are physical, and they change every second. It can change every second, every minute, every hour. So we need something that we can stand upon. And the thing we can stand upon is our faith. And this is what James is trying to do. And to sum it up, I want to give us a, a, a baseline definition for, for, uh, for faith. Because I know I told them what the scripture says, but I want to wear it down a little bit more. And I'm going to uh, use some scripture verses to uh, back up what I'm saying. All faith is, people, is heart truth. Heart truth. Right. Now, I'm going to give us an example because I don't want nobody to say, what the you do so much. All right. So, in John chapter 2, verse 23, Jesus had just did the first year that I've ever known to, to uh, that he first did the first year that he ever performed uh, by turning water to wine. So after this time, you know, he got a big gathering of people following him because they see the miracles and, and they like, hmm, this guy here too. But I want to read what it says. Because you think these some, some saved folk, man. You think these folk that grieve, right? So it said, now, speaking of, um, like I said, John chapter 2, verse 23. It said, now when he was in the room at the Passover, in the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. So if you start right now and, and, and don't continue to read, you'll be like, oh, he's saved to me. So keep, keep reading. He said, but well, Jesus did not commit himself unto them. Why did he commit himself? Keep reading. Because he knew all men and needed that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in the heart of man. So he knew these people did not exhibit heart trust. They trusted him because of the miracle. And they didn't trust him with everything. With they didn't have that heart trust to be like, I know he's the Messiah. I know he's the Son of God. I know he's the one that came to save me from my sin. They said, oh, I see somebody that can, that can uh, produce a new miracle, so I want to follow him. So Jesus didn't trust him. Now I want to give us another example of heart trust. In Acts chapter 8, God remember he's right the time after Pentecost, the gospel being spread. 
And uh, Philip was sent down to Samaria. He went to Samaria to, to preach the gospel. People get saved. Now, while he was out there preaching the gospel, there was a, a soothsayer out there named uh, Simon. Simon came about doing all these miracles and, and magic and everything. And people thought he was a uh, you know, child of God that he was doing a random thing and he was deceiving people. So, when the gospel was being spread by Philip, people were getting saved. And Simon was watching. And Simon told, uh, Simon told Philip, he was like, man, how are you doing it? Like, he said, I want, I want to be able to do it, you know? And so, Philip went ahead and got baptized. So, this, I mean, excuse me, uh, Simon got baptized. Simon was a sorcerer, man. But, so him getting baptized, him getting the gospel, you would, miss, you would think he's saved and you stop the story right there. So the story goes on and say that John and Peter came, came down there and they started laying hands on people. And when they were laying hands on them, they, the Holy Spirit would descend down upon the people that were saved. And you know what Simon said? Simon had no destiny. He had no destiny to ask Peter and, 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 and John. He said, man, how are y'all doing this? He said, man, I want to have that power with y'all. I want to be able to do what y'all do. You know what Peter responds more to Simon? And that's chapter 8, verse 20. He said, but Peter told him, because he tried to buy uh, the Holy Spirit. Uh, now, one thing about it, we can't buy God. Uh, we cannot buy God. Yeah. You know, a lot of people try to do that. A lot of people give money. You know, we, we got these schemes, these churches, they say you give so much money, and this and that happened. Now, let me tell you, that's a lie from a piece of hell, because that is not true. That is not gospel-centered truth. And Peter is about to, to verify this right here. Peter said, but you, but Peter told me, may your silver be destroyed with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Yeah. You have no part or share in this matter because what? Your heart is not right before God. I don't think y'all hear me today. I don't think y'all hear me today. See, it starts with the heart. So this was a man that on the surface, you would have thought he was saved. But as he kept walking along on his journey and he started trying to purchase something, that only God can give, we see that he wasn't with God. And the centrality of what his problem was is the fact that his heart wasn't right. So what I'm trying to say is God brings such tests to prove and increase the strength and quality of one's faith and to demonstrate his belief. My third point, God's grace is sufficient even in your trial. Yes, God's grace yes. is sufficient in your trial. Yes, I want to look at the life of Paul. Paul was a man who, if you look at everything he went through, he was like, man, God, leave Paul when he was like. Bible said a man was snake beam, shipwrecked, he had eye disease, and he didn't have good speech, he was stoned, he was whipped, he was martyred. The list goes long, but these go long enough. You know, I can tell you my third most thing that happened to Paul. We ain't got this type of time. But Paul was the person who wrote the book of Philippians. He wrote Philippians while he was incarcerated in Corinth. And one of the things he said in Philippians chapter 4, when he asked, he said throughout the whole book, to be, to, uh, be honest, he said it several times. But I want to just speak to Peter chapter 4, starting at verse 4. He said, rejoice always. Uh, now, how is he going to tell somebody to rejoice and he's still getting breathing? Uh, he's writing letters behind all. But he tells somebody to rejoice. He said, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Now, what did James say? Tell us to do? Tell it all joy. Which means what? Rejoice. In spite of what you may feel, what you may do. Somebody may say, Brother Christian, why I got to rejoice in when I'm going through all this? Well, let me tell you something. You rejoice in the fact that you still got your job. You rejoice in the fact that you still you still got your man. God is preserving you. You rejoice in the fact that your kid ain't not in the street doing everything. 
You trust in the fact that God is good to you in spite of what you want. Amen. Amen. God deserves to be praised, glorified, and honored at all times. There is no excuse, Christian. I don't care what you're going through. And I'm not saying that to say that, you know, what you're going through is not important. But I, what I'm saying is there's a remedy for it. There's something we are called to do in spite of what we're going through to help us get through what we're going through. In the same chapter, Paul said in verse 11, chapter 4, verse number 8, he said, now that, Not that I speak from me, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am in. Now, for somebody to learn something, that means what? They had to be through something. So, in this particular time, now, I'm sure when Paul wrote this, he was thinking about everything that he had went through. But I don't want to still be that one thing he went through that stood out to me in the Bible. You know, in St. Corinthians, they talk about him having a thorn in the side of his flesh. Now, this thorn was something that Paul couldn't get rid of. Now, if I know specifically to tell us what it was, but well, that's good for us. Because we can put our thorn right there. Because all, right, all, right. all of us have, um, uh, have a thorn at some point, or have had a thorn, or will have a thorn. Right, one. One. Yeah. So, Think about this. Paul prayed. They said that Paul was caught up in the third year. And he said he prayed to God three times. He said, concerning me, but I plead with the Lord three times that I would that it would leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most glad to boast in all the more about my weakness so that Christ's power will reside in me. So this is better. If God decides not to move us out of that trial when we want him to move us out of that trial, tell him all good. Because when we are weak, what? We are strong. We are strong because of him. Because he gives us the grace to be able to persevere and to be triumphant over whatever we may be standing. Yes, sir. Because we all go through something. And, and, and for Paul to plead multiple times, think about what he did. He petitioned three times. Amen. Not one, not two, but three. So this is something that was irritating him. Like, it was getting on his nerve, and he said, Lord, please get rid of me. Yeah. Please, Lord. But he told him, my grace is sufficient. Now, the question is, why did Paul have a thorn? Paul gave two reasons for having a thorn. Number one, the reason he had a thorn was because of his anointing and his divine and ordained purpose. Because remember, it says, because of the revelation and God exposed to him and he used him, the thorn, in essence, was a part of his process. Paul could have been who he was without that thorn. Now, don't make no mistake about that. But that's what you said. So for us, because God ain't hear me, y'all can't be who y'all are without going through stuff that y'all are going through. If there's somebody in here today that ain't going through something, I might need you to remain with your life. Amen. You might want to see what direction you're going, because all of us are going to go through something. Yes, sir. But James said, counting all joy, we He didn't say you. The second thing is, I'm finna, I'm finna close the thing, right? Please. Second thing is, the reason Paul get, was given the thorn, they said to keep, to keep him from being conceived. Mm -hmm. So that means that we all can have a tendency to get a little prideful and feel like we big dog and feel like, you know, can't nobody touch us because we did that and third. But you know what? God will give you something to take from him to him. So really, and, 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 and Paul had to, Paul had to do something, you know? Because that's the matter. Paul could have walked around and said, hey, I've been to heaven, what you doing? <laughs> he would have been like, right. yeah, yeah. he went to heaven. Yeah, yeah. I went to heaven, what you doing? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. This is why God gives us trial. Mm -hmm. And then Paul's thorn. It would give us a thorn if you don't already have one. 
you. <laughs> See, we can be strong even in the midst of our trial. And God wants to be strong. Power is strong. Because you know, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, when he said that, he meant that the demeanor of what he was trying to communicate to the Philippine church, the church in Philippi, he was telling them, I don't care how low I am. I don't care what I go through. I've been through so much in my life. God has still spared me. God has been the divine father to still take care of me. God still give me the strength to write all these epistles that I'm writing. Some of the ones I wrote while I was incarcerated. Some of the ones I wrote while I was on the run. God still gave me the power to do things that I probably couldn't do if I didn't have the grace of God. So two things I want us to just remember that you read code. God wants us to find or discover in our trial spiritual maturity. And he also wants to find God's glory. I heard about this story. And I'm getting ready to go. I know I've said it about three times, but I'm gonna be done that I say this story. I heard about this story where there's this young man on the plane, little boy, he probably about seven or eight years old. They were on a plane going to Zambia on that day. And the plane was experiencing some very violent turmoil. And there was this lady that was sitting right beside the young man. The young man was on his video game, thinking he was probably playing with me. He was going to switch the song, had a nap on me, and he was going to have him a good time. But the lady was over there, terrified, shaking in her boots, she was like, she was looking at the little boy like, how is this boy sitting up here playing a video game in the midst of all of this that's going on in the life around him? Because like I said, the plane is experiencing some violent turbulence now. I'm talking about up and down, shaking everything. You know, and so the, the woman got mad. <laughs> she pulled a little boy uh, headphones off and she told, she asked him, she said, so what's wrong with you? She said, how are you over here playing a video game in the midst of everything? You don't feel all this turbulence? You don't feel this violent windstorm with everything that's going around you? You know the little boy told her? He said, ma'am, he said, ma, I'm not afraid of one of because my daddy is tired. So he said, I know everything's going to be all right. Somebody said something to y'all today. Like that. y'all daddy. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they still need to fall. Basically, what that little boy told that woman, Proverbs chapter 3, he told her, Trust the Lord, follow your heart. Lean back to your own understanding. That's why he was able to still play his video game, because he knew his daddy was private, and he knew everybody was going to be okay. And that wasn't his first time being with that type of turbulence. So, if God really cares, God cares for us, He really does. He will be us when we are, even in our trial. He really does. So I just want to encourage you all stay strong. Stay strong in it. And stay focused on God. Don't be like Peter when Peter was out there. You know I, mean? I, 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 like to, I always like to give people this story. One of my favorite stories is Peter walking on the wall. When people going through stuff, I always tell them this because one of the things in the story was Peter was the one that said, Lord, if it's you, call me, come out there. So Peter walking out there, the Bible saying that Peter walking on the wall. However, as the story progresses, it also said Peter started looking at the strength of the wind that was surrounding him. And when that happened, what happened? He started to sink. He got scared. He got, he almost, he fought all on the ground. He cried by that angry. Because you know why? The problem he had wasn't even a problem. Because he already walking on the problem. He walking on the water with Christ. God is, God is right there with him. So what I'm trying to say to people is don't put too much focus on your problem. I'm not saying don't think about your problem, but think about God more than your problem. Know that, know that God can fix any problem. May not fix it the way you want to fix it, but He will definitely fix it and He will see you through. And as I told you today, I tell 
that you all respect the seats in God's word. Stand firm in your faith, knowing that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will one day return. Know that we just like selling in the midst of a scene that one day we will hear our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ say, Well done! Well done! Well done, thy good and faithful servant. One day, and what, you know, I made you rules over a few things. You've been faithful over a few things, and I made you rules over many things. But until then, my brothers and sisters, you have work to do. And remember, when one brings glory to God's name, you've all brought glory to God's name. When one falls short of God's glory, you've all fallen short of God's glory. Together we stand, divide and fall, God bless you all.